pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another page 112 tag. This is the totally blind version, which means that somebody, in this case, one of my somewhat new subscribers has sent me th three page 112 excerpts and I don't know anything about who the writer or title is because he sent that information in a second email which I have not yet opened. So I'm going to read the excerpts to you totally blind. I don't know who the author is or what the title is. Give you my responses. You will make your own evaluation of these three excerpts and then I will rank the three pages in terms of my preferences and you will do the same and then together we will find out who the heck wrote these books and what these books are. These pages were sent to me by my somewhat new subscriber a few months, a couple months ago maybe, Alan Morton. I don't know much about him so maybe he'll introduce himself more in the comment section below if he feels like it but I'm very happy that he sent me these pages. Without further ado, here is book number one. He turned and looked at her as if prompted by some sixth sense, just as she walked down the aisle of the magnificent, airy, perpendicular church. Her immediate impression was of his great size and of the luxuriant anarchy of his jet black hair. He smiled at her, and she found herself smiling back. Well, why not smile? It was a wedding. He sat at the bride's side, she, of course, on the groom's. She knelt in imitation of a woman at prayer, feeling ashamed but knowing that she'd have felt even more ashamed if she'd shocked her parents by not kneeling. Her mother, radiant in a black dress of Welsh lace embroidered with curling Celtic patterns, turned and smiled at her, and Kate turned as if to look at the 15th century stained glass for which Fairford Church is justly famed and whose importance the golden boy had explained. They're all very proud of the glass. For goodness sake, swat up on it so you can hold your own, he'd urged, more keyed up than she had ever seen him, though that wasn't surprising. Yes, the windows were beautiful, but it wasn't because of them that she turned around. She turned to see if she could meet the big man's eyes again. She did. An uncharacteristically coy impulse made her slide her eyes past him and up to the great west window. Then she looked back at him and grinned in admission of the deception. He grinned back. There was nothing classically good-looking about him. He was too ungainly. His shoulders were too bulky. He seemed slightly hunched, as if embarrassed by his size. But Kate thought him the second most handsome man that she had seen all day. Oh my goodness! I read these excerpts through twice before filming, and uh, this one is growing on me more each time. I really like it. The first time I thought, mm, a little bit formal, a little bit old-fashioned sounding but no i mean it, it there is a bit of that but i think it's really intelligent lively prose and some lovely turns of phrase the luxuriant anarchy of his jet black hair and i mean it's just such a lively sexual energy to the cruising straight people know how to cruise my goodness she's certainly holding her own so does as the golden boy would say and I love that dialogue from the Golden Boy. Is the Golden Boy the most handsome man she'd seen that day? Is the Golden Boy the groom? Whose wedding is this? His shoulders were too bulky? How is that possible? <laughs> yeah, though this has a really appealing energy to it. I want to find out much, much more. I really like it. All right, here's book number two. While I regard myself as a man ever open to suggestion, I confess that this particular proposal held little appeal. 
In the first place, I felt that an agreement once entered upon should be properly adhered to by both parties, if only as a matter of principle, and it had been amply clear that we were to stop at Kingston. There was, in truth, also another consideration. Ever since the sincerity had reached open waters and so encountered the full motion of the seas, the pleasing prospect of our first landfall had been greatly, even ceaselessly, in my thoughts. The possibility of this now becoming even further removed and of my remaining aboard ship continuously for two months or more was therefore far from welcome. I believe we should keep to our original course, I told the captain firmly. It's to your own advantage, Cooley insisted. Assistance came to me from an unexpected quarter. Potter's head loomed down from his bunk bed. But we must call in at Jamaica, he declared simply. Besides, I cannot believe it would add so greatly to our journey, seeing as we have to go near. I must confess I had found the behavior of the expedition surgeon far from helpful, a matter which I will recount more fully later, and yet his words at this moment were welcome enough. Cooley tried to threaten us with his sea technicality, but when I warned him that I might be forced to reconsider the charter fee that we had agreed, his face, which normally displayed a kind of beaming slyness, quite scowled. I'll see what I can do, he promised sourly. But with this, he and Brew marched away, grumbling to one another in that infuriating language of theirs. I am never one, I must insist, to indulge self-pity. I have, indeed, observed that this quality can be as much the undoing of a man as drink, leading him into ever greater aimlessness and despond. And yet I confess the days after we departed from the River Blackwater had hardly been my happiest. The start of my difficulties was, I believe, the dinner we were served the evening we set sail, which was excessively fatty, while matters were not helped when, on retiring that night, I found the cabin became filled with a most noxious smell, much like a terrible gaseous pond, and which, I was later told, was caused by water in the bilges, becoming disturbed by the movement of the ship. All right, what did you think of that? Uh, uh, actually, it sounded better when I read it aloud than it sounded when I read it silently to myself the first two times, but no, I don't like it. It, it actually reminds me of the Edgar Allan Poe novella, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. It really reminds me of that. I wonder if it's from there. I, I'm pretty sure Alan checked my Goodreads, so he wouldn't have uh, submitted it. If, it, if I'd read it, but it really reminds me of that, and I thought that was just drudgery reading that. There was a couple vivid scenes in it that I enjoyed, but most of it was like this. I mean, it's just, it's very old-fashioned diction. It's either 19th century prose or somebody, you know, imitating it in modern times. Yeah, I don't like the language. I mean, it has a certain charm, right? It's well done, but... I don't like it. Yeah, no, not my cup of tea. Book number three. There are matters one simply cannot get drawn into that one must distance oneself from if the price is not life and limb. Perhaps this would have been all right if he had said the same thing, but referred directly to Hannah or himself. Talking about what one must and must not do and what it costs did not do justice to the seriousness of Hannah's question. She had wanted to know what she should have done in her particular situation, not that there are things that are not done. The judge's answer came across as hapless and pathetic. Everyone felt it. They reacted with sighs of disappointment and stared in amazement at Hannah, who had more or less won the exchange. But she herself was lost in thought. So should I have, should I have not, should I not have signed up at Siemens? It was not a question directed at the judge. She was talking out loud to herself, hesitantly, because she had not yet asked herself that question and did not know whether it was the right one. Or what the answer was. 
This is intriguing. And I can't quite put my finger on why. Again, the language is a bit antiquated, but it's much more lively for me than book number two. And especially, you know, the way that the narrative is objecting to the use of one. One simply cannot get drawn into. I love that. And what's going on? What kind of dialogue is going on between Hannah and the judge? It's not a courtroom, is it? In what capacity would Hannah be asking a judge a question that would elicit this kind of answer in a courtroom? I can't imagine that there would be a situ situation where that would be true. Especially then, that when she would then go on to ask a rhetorical question. So, what's going on? Who is Hannah and who is the judge? And what matters shouldn't Hannah have gotten herself drawn into? And what does it mean that she had signed up at Siemens? I'm quite intrigued to find out more. Okay, so I have changed my mind, as I often do. I read through these excerpts silently, usually, a few times, twice, usually, before I start, before I turn the camera on, and then I read them aloud to you, and I often change my mind. So, I think my original estimation was that book three narrowly beat out book number one is my first choice, and followed by book one in a distant third with book two, but I have changed my mind. Book one is m the one that's most compelling, followed by book three, but they're very close together, and then book two, a distant third. So what made me change my mind? I just think that the more I read the excerpt from book number one, the more it appeals to me, and the more I would be likely to pick this one up first, but I am still quite curious about what's going on with book three but book one beats it by about five points and then book two is down about 30 points yeah it reminds me too much of that edgar Allan Poe. Ugh. all right i'm gonna take you into the my den my office my den of iniquity uh, let's find there. out what these books are oh this is fascinating oh wow <laughs> okay so my first pick was book number one, and I've never heard of the title or the author. The title is Going Gently, and the author is David Nobbs, N-O-B-B-S. Who the hell is David Nobbs? I'm about to find out. And my third pick, it's actually a book I've read, but I didn't recognize it at all, and that's The Reader by Bernard Schlink. I love this novel. It's probably... If I had to make a top 15 list of novels, this would probably be number 11 or 12. I really love this novel. Didn't recognize it at all. And how fascinating that book number two is not an old novel. It's a historical novel called English Passengers by Matthew Neal. I'm aware of the title and the author, but that's it. How interesting. So who is David Nobbs and what's going gently all about? Okay, well, this sounds amazing. Russell, if you're listening, this is a book for you. It was published in 2000, and it's about a 99-year-old, beautiful, intelligent, witty, passionate, and sexy woman named Kate Thomas. Sounds, especially based on the writing, it sounds really intriguing. And she's had a stroke, and she's lying in bed, kind of playing the video of her life, maybe in her mind. So it sounds like a much racier version of, what's the one? Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk? It sounds kind of like that, but maybe better. I've never heard of this. I'm clicking on Want to Read right now. So very intrigued by that one. Okay, uh, I had to go back into the living room and come back, and I forgot to put the lapel microphone on my lapel. So I think the recording of that last section is adequate, but... This should be better. So yeah, English Passengers by Matthew Neal, published in 2001, set in 1857. We heard reference to a Cooley, that's the captain, 
He has a band of rum smugglers from the Isle of Man, and they have some adventures. It sounds completely like not my kind of book, but I bet others of you out there might enjoy it. But yeah, it really reminded me of that Arthur Gordon Pym narrative by Edgar Allan Poe, which was just like fingers down a chalkboard by the end for me. And I actually thought that it, this excerpt might have come from later part of the book because I was skim slash hate reading that by the end. And The Reader by Bernard Schlink. I think it was published in the 1990s, maybe, uh, 1995. I won't check it, but I, I loved it. I haven't read anything else by him. The movie was really great. So what about you? I'd be very curious to hear what your picks are. What order would you have ranked them? And have you read any of these books? So thank you, Alan. I really enjoyed it. That was a great batch. Don't worry that you sent me one that I had already read. It doesn't matter. It was fun. And... If anybody else out there is interested in sending me some totally blind page 112 excerpts, or if you are a booktuber yourself and you'd like to do an exchange of blind page 112s, let me know. Thanks for watching.